Hey. Hi, the stream. Hello, Hello stream. stream. So far, the only person that I know is in the stream is uh, Jeremiah because he said something in the chat. Um, oh, yes, Echo. Sorry, I knew about that. Thank you for reminding me. That should fix the echo. People say hi. Ish. Uh, Lewis, say hi. Hello. Hello. Hello, Did that people. Fix the echo. Wait for Jeremiah to tell us. No echo. Ah, uh -huh. great. Thank you, sir. Uh, if there's anybody else in the chat and wants to say hi, let, uh, make sure you do so. Um, you know, just so we know who's around. Um, for whatever reason, um, I didn't notice that I'm not actually logged into Twitch, so I can't, you know, talk to you on in the chat as me. I am um, probably some random unnamed guest, seventeen forty three ninety seven or something. Uh, you know, <laughs> as these things go. All right, so we are going to record an episode about uh, some PDFs that we all looked at, uh, well, that we individually looked at, and then each person will get a chance to sort of talk about what their thing is, and we can all sort of then grill them about what it is that, that they read, uh, and we get to learn about a bunch of different stuff, because there are 500 new PDF products published every day. That's my estimate. Uh, you know, so... Um, this way we get to sort of get a sampling of a bunch of different things um, all at once. We only get to pull these these PDF mini review episodes in uh, what, what, once, maybe twice a year at most. So this is our chance to, <laughs> to get that taken care of. So, All right, so let me hit record on the audio so that later on Sam can do the wonderful uh, editing job that he does to make me sound like I'm not dumb. Um, <laughs> yes, Jeremiah assumes that that means we're going to be be reviewing all 500 PDFs that get got published today, because um, we're ambitious that way. No, we'll we'll, we'll be reviewing three, <laughs> one each. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. challenge accepted. Okay, Lewis is going to do 498 <laughs> reviews, and Ish and I are each going to do uh, one. <laughs> so, yes, That's go fair. big or That's go right. home, baby. <laughs> All right, I am now recording the audio so that Sam can get that for editing at a later time. Um, are we ready? Should I get started? Yes, yes sir. Right. Oh, this it did this last night, too. Uh, it, I noticed last night, or not last night, two nights ago during our uh, stream, every now and then it took one of our guests and just turned them into the Skype logo. Um, we could still hear them okay. It did it to Tracy a bunch mm -hmm. on Tuesday. Um, today it's right now it's doing it to, to Ishmael. Um, so I think he's still there. Say something, Ishmael. I'm yeah. here. So we can still hear him. Can you hear me? We just don't see him. Right. Uh, and if it works out the same as it did, uh, the other night, um, he'll, he'll pop back in later. His video will pop back in later. Um, sort of on its own. At least that's what it did before. Yeah. Jeremiah suggests that maybe we should get Microsoft to be a sponsor since we keep showing logos of their of their software, right? <laughs> Valid. Yeah. I, I, I'm sure that uh, gaming podcasts are exactly the kind of thing that they're looking to sponsor. To up, up their, up their uh, brand well, recognition. Now that they're trying to push... Yeah, they're trying to push their, their Twitch uh, competitor mixer, so you never uh, know. <laughs> so so maybe if we're willing to switch over to Mixer, huh? <laughs> yeah, get those big Microsoft Woo! bugs. All right, now I'm going to get started. Now Sam's got a good minute and a half of us with this conversation to to listen to it and cut out. <laughs> all right, um, all right, and I'm and in case anybody didn't notice, I am flying solo. Tracy is not with us today. Um, she is in a situation where. Um, she didn't have any time to actually read and review anything because she's been working from home with a child running around, uh, and, and all of that. And so, um, finding the time to do any actual reading for review purposes just wasn't, uh, feasible for her. So, um, which sounded fair to me. She's got a little one and they're a little harder to wrangle while also getting things done. 
Absolutely. All right, so let's get started. This episode of the Tome Show is brought to you by listeners like you. Thanks for using the Tome's Amazon and DMs Guild affiliate links and for becoming patrons at patreon.com slash the Tome Show. Welcome to the Tome, a D&D news, reviews, and interview show, and I'm your Tome host, Jeff Greiner. And in this episode number 336, we're going to wrestle Strahd to hell uh, as we bring you a handful of PDF mini-reviews. So, joining me for this episode are a couple of Tome Show regulars. First, from our social media hellscape, we have Ishmael Alvarez. Ish, welcome back. Nice to be back. Uh, I'm waving, even though some of you can't yes, see it. Yes, we are, we are streaming uh, the recording on twitch.tv slash Tome Show, as we've been doing uh, for a few months now. Um, so anybody who's out there uh, listening and wants to see these come out live can feel free to see the un, uncut, unedited video as we record it there. And then you can even um, give us snarky comments like uh, Jeremiah McCoy, who's in the chat right now, um, I'm sure we'll be doing as we as we proceed through the through the recording. <laughs> um, so yes, that's uh, Ismail. And then also, secondly, we have straight from the news desk uh, of the Tome Show News is our master of the squared circle. It's Lewis Brenton. Good evening, friends. All right, and he's not. Well, he maybe he did wave. I'm looking at the wrong video. <laughs> I'm watching the stream, and it's a few seconds behind. So there's a wave. Okay. <laughs> Finger good. <There> go. go. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, so um, this is a PDF mini review episode. Uh, we do these every now and then, and when we do PDF mini reviews, we like to discuss PDFs from various sources, although... I think in this case, we may be looking at all PDFs that are available on the DMs Guild. Um, some of these we've received review copies of, and some others we bought ourselves, and we just found them too interesting not to discuss. Uh, first up, we will hear from Lewis, who's going to be talking about the Grappler's Handbook. Second, we'll be hearing from Ismail uh, discussing the Hellscapes product. And lastly, I will be talking about the inter interactive Tome of Strahd. Of these, I believe Hellscapes is the only one that was provided as a review copy um, that uh, Ismail will be discussing. So uh, the, the, Lewis and I yes. uh, paid our, our hard-earned uh, cash, right? We're, we're flush with all of the preacher and teacher money over <laughs> here. Uh, <laughs> so we're, we, we, we bought our PDFs and just found them too interesting not to discuss. Uh, before we get too far into that, though, I want to thank all of our listeners who support the show. You can do so uh, very easily. You can either go shopping over at DMs Guild or Amazon, just like you normally would. The exact same prices, the exact same experience. But if you go there through the links at thetomeshow.com, we get a small percentage and, and you can support us um, that way. And that money gets spread around to all the various people who contribute to various shows uh, at the Tome Show. Um, and then also you can support us directly at Patreon, uh, patreon.com slash The Tome Show. Just like Leonard Pelche, Jill Sanders, Doug Palmer, and Merrick Blackman, we are almost at the level uh, of, of support on Patreon where I will just turn down any requests for sponsorships that come my way. Uh, and we will rely entirely on the Patreon patrons to uh, basically to pay the bills that make the show possible, right? I've never tried to make money on the show. I've always just tried to make it a hobby that pays for itself. Uh, that's always been my goal. So uh, you can do that by going shopping on those places or by uh, becoming a patron at patreon.com slash the Tome Show. All right, so three PDFs to review. Um, and first up is Lewis. Lewis is talking to us about the Grappler's Handbook, and that's all I can say about it because I know nothing else about this product. So tell us about this, Lewis. What is the Grappler's Handbook? Yeah. So to, to get into this a little bit, obviously um, when we're doing these sorts of reviews, we're pulling from a near infinite supply of stuff just on DMs Guild, if nowhere else even. Uh, there's always so much good new stuff coming out. And... Uh, 
when uh, when this was proposed to me to be on the show, uh, this gave me an excuse to look at the top 10 or 15 PDFs I've been wanting to buy and read. And, uh, and I went with this one because uh, recently in my two parties, I've got two different games going, uh, one uh, Dungeons and Dragons and one Adventures of Middle Earth using the 5e rule set. And uh, I've, my players have been trying to grapple a lot. Mm. And uh, they they don't just want to stab the goblins. No, no, no. They want to wrestle them. <laughs> and uh, and uh, Some, so something uh, that five E is something to, that five E is not particularly like good at. Um, yes, and I feel like for good reason, right? Like we had some fairly robust grappling rules back in the third edition days, and it was kind of a mess. It was just so complicated. It was this whole other system that that a lot of, that turned a lot of people away. Um, so I think by the time they got to fourth edition, they're like, you know what, let's just do something simple, something so people can like go get along. And they did the same thing for fifth, mm-hmm. fifth edition and figured, well, and then people can like, you know, fill in the gaps and do what they want with it from, from there. They can start with that baseline and then otherwise we're going to stay out of it. So this is somebody who decided That's not right. to stay out of it, who decided to, to give you that complicated <laughs> system. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um, and in general, I'm a great appreciator of the relative simplicity of the 5e combat rules. I mean, I really am. 5e is my favorite edition. I think it's fantastic mm-hmm. in 95 out of 100 possible categories. I really, really like it. And this one particular tiny little area, I wish they had turned the dial maybe two more notches uh, just to add a little bit more to the, the grappling rules. And uh, that's what this gentleman has done. So the author of this uh, PDF are uh, Joshua and Jaden Vargo. And uh, Joshua uh, is an adult man about our age, mm-hmm. and Jaden is his teenage son. Mm. And, uh, and I actually, after I read the, the, the handbook a couple of times, I actually reached out to Joshua on Twitter and kind of did some, uh, some interview questions with him uh, through DMs and had a really great conversation with the guy. Mm. And it was very helpful. Uh, and he shared with me why he wanted to do this resource, which I thought was great. He, uh, For him, the deal was uh, he, he comes from a pretty extensive martial arts background himself. Uh, and I could tell that right away when I, when I read this material. Uh, I have a pretty heavy martial arts background in my past, too. First time, I immediately thought, okay, this person either has a heavy martial arts background or they have they have really intensely interviewed people who have a heavy martial arts background to describe some of the movements and, and the positions the way they did. Uh, there was there was a, the sound of experience there. And it turned out that he developed these rules because most of his play group is his buddies from the dojo. Mm. Nice. And uh, and so they wanted just a just a touch more realism in the hand to hand combaty parts of of D and D. Uh, and so what this book does is it provides really a big, big menu of optional stuff that you can use to, uh, to, to tweak what grappling is in the game, because in the rules as written, grappling is super, super simple. Uh, basically all you do is immobilize someone from moving. You haven't stopped them from swinging on you. You haven't anything like that. You've right. just reduced their movement score to zero. Um, and that's fine. And then there's a grappler feet in the feet options, but even that is fairly minimal. Um, and what these guys have done is they've said, here's a, a set of options to take grappling from a complexity level of two optionally all the way up to about, I'd say a six or a seven out of 10. If you wanted to go that far, I wouldn't want to, but it's, but there's a lot of good stuff here. And uh, so, so it's, it's they, uh, fairly easily yeah. scalable, right? You could start with just a little bit more robust and you can go to like a full simulation of, of a martial arts tournament. Right, right. Yeah, I think so. And I think that's good and necessary because like when, with, with my background, a lot of my buddies that I gamed with were martial artists as well. When we were playing 
role-playing games that were reasonably human games, so not like superhero games and not fighting Cthulhu, but when it was people against people, we would often actually stand up at the table and show the maneuvers we were trying to do <laughs> to the bad guys. I'm sure we've all done that at various points, you know. Um, and even if there were wooden swords leaned against the corner, which there often were, sometimes we'd walk <laughs> through the sword fight and, okay, what did he do last time? Okay, well, I'm going to do this then and, and do that kind of thing. And this this, this sets that up really well because they even consider questions of positioning. Like uh, he, they start with all the basic grappling positions. Like for, first would be if both people are standing. Uh, the second would be if one person's prone and the other person is standing over them, which is a very different mm -hmm. grappling position with a whole different set of things going on. Um, uh, if they're in mount, which no one would have known what that was until mixed martial arts became a thing just a few years ago, but where the, the, the top guy is straddling the bottom guy and is in control, or if he's in guard where one guy's prone and the other guy's on his knees between the guy's legs, really the bottom guy is a little bit more in control than the top guy is in that position. And these guys know that, and they've they've written that way. And a side control and even a back control, you're on your back, but he's on his back on top of you, and you're choking him or something so, like so that. Thi so this, and uh, that's just the starting say, This position. system incorporates all of that, the different positionings and, and that kind of stuff that, that could come up? Absolutely. So, so yeah. does, it, does, and it, basically, does it incorporate all of that from – along the entirety of the scale like if i'm just want to incorporate it at a, at a level of a two does 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 that matter sure. or is that are you talking like at the, the level of 10 sort of granularity piece because that seems really granular to me yeah sure sure yeah see to me that's just fun okay, <laughs> you know, we should wrestle later <laughs> yeah, no, we, should. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we will wrestle for control of the tone okay empire. you win it's yours <laughs> 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 now, um, what's great about it is what what they've done, and they're very they, again they show their experience in actual martial arts. Each of those positions only has a certain number of moves you can do. So, if you're in this position, the menu of moves is only this big, rather than all the moves available. And they they signal that in the book of if one's prone, one's standing, then here's your options. You know, so rather because there's there must be thirty or forty different grapple options in this thing. I, I never counted them, but it's a bunch. Uh, but they, they've they got them really clearly marked of, if you're both standing, here's the menu. If, if you're both, uh, if you're in, if you're in, if you're prone, if you're in top mount, bottom mount, top guard, all that stuff, here's the available menu. And, uh, and they even give options, which I think is really cool to where if you successfully resolve the initial grapple check, which is still basically just an athletics versus athletics or uh, acrobatics on the defender's part thing, then you execute your maneuver, but it may open the opportunities for succeed. Then on your bonus action, you can do this. Or on your next action, now you can do this. So there's a real, again, a good logical progression that, again, shows that they know the, the material they're talking about. Mm -hmm. Uh, when they do this. And uh, I think all that's brilliantly done. Um, another neat feature is they include a few what they call implements, which are uh, pieces of equipment, basically weapons that would be grappler appropriate mm -hmm. weapons and how you might use them in your maneuvers. Like they include the sigh, the little small pitchfork looking thing with the two prongs Raphael's on it. Raphael's weapon. Uh, the tonfo. Yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's right. Uh, or the tonfo, which is like the, the modern police stick that's got a stick and then a little stick sticking out like this. And even nunchucks uh, to, to use to um, enhance your grappling. So if you're using those as your regular combat weapons and a grappling situation unfolds, in those cases, you're not dropping your sword to grab the guy. Instead, you're flipping your tonfo around and hooking it around his neck, and now that we just keep going kind of a thing. Um, they did a great job with that stuff. I love it. I love it. Um, they also include a handful of, uh, of NPCs with some grappling skills and techniques built into their, their uh, stat blocks uh, so that you might throw them in there. Uh, so here's a here's an NPC I'm looking at that's got a a mean uh, elbow flip technique. Uh, here's one that's got a 
an inescapable grasp feature, uh, and just several of the different techniques that are in the game are written into these these text blocks. Um, and they've even included some rules at the end for a grappling tournament. If you wanted to do that, um, then there's they've actually included some rules for that. Uh, so yeah, uh, I think I would say. I'd give this a, like an eight out of a 10. I think it's a really good resource. Uh, the places where it falls a little short is um, I wish it gave a little more guidance on how to ease these things in. Because if you just, if you took this whole bucket and dumped it into your game, it would break the game. Um, because, uh, you know, this includes stuff like, uh, arm breaks and choke holds and things like that. And in that do things that the five E combat system has written, isn't set up to handle very well. And if you break a dude's arm in round, he's a hundred hit point, bad guy, but you just broke his arm. Then we got a whole different thing going on. Adequately. You've changed the scale of the combat a lot. Uh, so I, if, if, uh, in fact, he, this is really cool. Uh, the author was very, interested in my feedback and we actually had some conversations about how he might improve it in future renditions uh which was great but that would be one thing is i wish he had given uh, given the price of the pdf this is a five dollar pdf this right. isn't a 99 cent thing um i wish he had given more of a a map of okay you want to do these things here's stage one throw this in and then if your players like that and it's not breaking your game here's stage two that kind of a some guidance, just another page or so that had that kind of thing in it. I thought it was great. Yeah, that's. But, uh, you, you, yeah. Bring, you bring up and the author was super nice guy. Was very willing to answer my questions. Great, great, great experience. You you bring up some interesting like that whole. You could, you could use this to to break the big bad's arm, you know, in round one, and that completely changes the nature of the, of the the game at that point. Um, that's a. I mean that's fairly significant. That's a thing, right? Um, that's that's part of why D and D has always had such sort of sort of a generalized combat, right? It's just hit points and, and attacks and damage, right? Yes. And then you can fill in. Oh, I just did a bunch of damage. The DM or or if if the player is given that that authority, right, can jump in and describe it as, oh, I put him in this arm arm break and, and broke his arm or whatever, right? Um. But having yeah. that as just a thing you can do kind of changes the balance and mechanics of the game in a fairly significant way, don't you think? Yeah, you know, absolutely. Yeah, no question. Uh, and he does give a little bit guidance for high health point creatures who is who who would be susceptible to mm -hmm. these kind of techniques and who wouldn't be until they're hit points were down to a certain percentage and that's all well and good. But overall, again, if you just dump this whole bucket of Legos out into your game, there's just way too much stuff. And he even kind of says so in right. his writing, but I just, I would have asked him you, Hey, just man, give us one more page with like a chart of right. something to, to give us a little more guidance of how to slowly ease this stuff mm -hmm. in and figure out what's going to be game. Well, and, and, and what's not. particularly that, I mean, cause it feels like there's a, you have a generalized damage system and then a very specific thing that, that's being added on with this grappler's handbook, right? Uh, to the point that they're not, yes. I mean, at that point, why would my fencer character not be able to make the call of, I stab him in the leg, right? Now I've got to incorporate all kinds of exactly. mechanics so that everybody has the, these options to do all that. With, you know, if I can break somebody's arm, why can't I slice off a finger or whatever, you know? Um, in many ways, that's a whole different game. So I'm really curious about this whole sliding scale thing that you talked about. That you can you can incorporate it at a level of a two up to a ten. You you, you described it. Um, so yeah. what you described was very granular, very specific, very detailed, and, and it sounds like very complex. Um, which is great if that's what you're what, what you need, right? It's the kind of thing like if I'm having a, right. a wrestling tournament as part of my campaign, let's this is, maybe we use these mechanics to do it, um, but I don't know that I Absolutely. want to use it all the time, right? Uh, so how does that level of complexity and the sliding scale work? Like how does the sliding how do you make it? How do I do a two? You know what when yeah. I do it when I incorporate it at a two, what's the difference that it makes? Yeah. 
I think what you'd have to do is uh, the dungeon master would have to walk through this document and pick which techniques he was comfortable with letting into his game individually he'd have to build he'd have to build his own menu basically okay. Uh, of okay and if you're in prone position rather than these nine techniques being available to you here are two or three right you okay. know um and probably that are the least game breaking uh that still have some evocative descriptive good stuff in them and that would make good role-playing sense okay um but i just liked like he even gave he gave a great rule for how people can take hit point damage in grappling situations, which sure. just doesn't exist in the game at all, you know. Uh, so, like, if uh, if somebody does what I would essentially call a judo hip toss and puts right. a guy, makes a guy, they called it making the rainbow. If you take a guy's legs and he goes whoosh, like right. completely <laughs> over your head and lands super hard, you know, he he gives a descriptor for the kind of damage that would do, rather than just. Oh, it's a melee attack. Okay, unless you're a monk, one hit point. Or right. a, an unarmed melee attack, one hit point unless you're well, a monk. And um, that brings up an interesting point because, like, you know, people talk about hit points and how hit points are supposed to be uh, more more generalized. You know, it's it's not a specific, it's not physical damage, but it's like they're winded or they're disadvantaged. You know, they got them on their heels and they're right. they're on the defense or whatever, uh, and all that's well and good. But then it doesn't make sense that even just the simple five e grappling mechanic. Okay, you're grappling and restrained. If that's a that's a fairly significant yes. disadvantage, why isn't that represented by hit points? But other but hit points represent these other things all the time, right? So I, I see where you're where you're saying yes. that. It sounds like when you say you could slide it the complexity up and down, though, um, it sounds like that's not a feature of the PDF, but just something that you very easily saw could be done with it just by limiting the menu. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and that would be the one thing I would want him to provide in a future printing of it, because uh, I can see how to do it very easily, uh, both just as a, a long experienced dungeon master and a guy who's done a lot of martial arts in my life. I get it, you know, um, and I can quickly look and see. No, nah, I can't let that technique be part of it because because what it'll turn into is every single fight from now on, he's immediately going to drop his sword and shield, grab the bugbear, and try to break his arm. You know, just it would lead to an unhelpful sort of repetitive, the, the worst part of what some feats have been in some editions of games, okay. I think, okay. you know, now the other question I had for you, could anybody do these or do you have to take a, do you have to be skilled in a certain area or take a feat mm -hmm. or whatever to be, to, to represent the training in how to do all these different maneuvers? Sure. Yeah, uh, he's got about three entryways uh, into this. Um, in general, somebody could do them. Um, uh, it's usually going to be a strength athletics-oriented character. Um, so the, the wizard's probably not going to want sure. to. Um, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but he also gives a variant for, um, for dex-based grapple maneuvers because man there's lots of tiny little brazilian jiu-jitsu practitioners who could just kill you and they, they weigh a hundred and nothing pounds but they could just break you in half um but uh so there's there's the general inclination that it's going to be more of a strengthy athletically so athletic -y sort of a person uh second he proposes an optional rule where grappling becomes an extra skill on the skills list mm. that you have proficiency in um and then your grappling stuff flows through that if you're proficient in the grappling. Um, so that's another option. And then a third option he gives is if you've taken the grappler feet, then here are some ways you can buff that feet that may or may not lead to all these extra techniques. But he just adds there's about a paragraph of if you if you don't want to do anything but just make the grappler feet better. Here's three or four bullet points on that. Right. Nice. OK, so. Very good. Yeah. Uh, Ismail, I have dominated uh, the questions here. Did you have any questions for Lewis about this, uh, the Grappler's Handbook? Uh, no. It, I mean, it, it, the, most of what you've said has mirrored what I was thinking about and the, the questions that I had. Um, it sounds like it could almost even be its own system. Um, 
which we've seen in Dungeons and Dragons before. We've seen in, in you know similar games where it's like, okay, here's normal combat, and then here's something else like a chase mechanic or a you know the ability to uh, you know have vehicle combat or whatever. It almost seems like something that you could just do by itself without having to involve hit point damage and other things like. You could have your own win conditions, like oh, when someone's pinned for three rounds or whatever, then that's they lose or what have you, things like that. Yeah. Um, so it just sounds like it could be a really cool addition uh, if you take it in that way, where it's like okay, this is be, this is great for like one on one combats. This is great for like duels and things like that. Um, it certainly sounds like it could be something that could be uh integrated into like mass massive combat where you've got like your five characters or whatever versus like 20 people but that's where maybe it would start getting breaking down or maybe it's not appropriate for like the boss battle as much because it's it doesn't really have a component there um unless the boss battle does happen to be a one-on-one which it could be pretty epic and awesome in its own right but uh that that would be my guess is that you would have to take this with a grain of salt and a spoonful of sugar and uh know that the characters would have to dial it back probably in certain circumstances. Yeah, I like the, uh, I think it's Marcus Bird 27 in the chat room point that has similar feelings that I do. Like this sounds like a really cool, like mini game to put in within my campaign. Um, but maybe mm-hmm. not for regular use, you know, so, sort of thing. Just, um, just so it doesn't, you don't run the risk of the, of the game breaking things and the, and the weird granularity uh, versus vagueness combat juxtaposition you know and there's there's probably like on that slider of like from one to ten there's probably like anywhere from one to four that could fit into normal combat uh i would i would guess and then it wouldn't necessarily break things it would just give more options and it's it's cool one thing i will say is that it gives probably like fighter types something to do that's not just like i whack it with my sword uh where other character types have all these options like why not uh, and of course, you get into the whole issue of the Book of Nine Swords, which is uh, almost a four-letter word with some communities. But uh, it's cool to see that there's at least options. That I really like the Book of Nine Swords, but maybe people don't like it because it was it was clearly like <laughs> an introduction to Fourth Edition before Fourth Edition, right? And people have strong strong feelings yes. about Fourth Edition, but which is also an edition I liked. But there oh, yeah. we are. Okay, before we get too far into that, <laughs> yeah. uh, Lewis, yeah. do you have any last things you want to say, or shall we move on? I'd say two things. First, Mark, Mark Bird, the guy that you just, you just mentioned, is actually a very oh. good friend of mine. He's one of my in one of my gaming groups. He's a he's a Memphis area That's guy. It. So thanks for watching, Mark. You're the man. Uh, and second, I, my overall opinion is I think this is a great resource. Uh, I came to it looking for some things, and nice. I found them. And uh, that's that's what the DMs that's, yeah, build I mean, is that's, for. That's honestly what you, you know, wanted. In these um, little, uh, yeah. you know. Two dollar, five dollar, even ten dollar PDF products. Like I don't need it to be everything that I need, right? I need it to be the specific thing that I need. Uh, so if it fits that need for you, that's exactly uh, if, it. If I was, yeah. you know, I've done that where I'm like, I, I really need a bunch of ideas for traps. So I do a quick DMs Guild search. I find, you know, that yes. that five dollar PDF with with two hundred traps in it, and I can pull out a handful of things that I want. And you know what? If I get three or four great ideas I want to use in my game tomorrow, it was totally worth it. That's it. That's All it. All right, then we will pass it on over to Ishmael. Ishmael, uh, Ish, you looked at Hellscapes. That is correct. I looked at Hellscapes. Um, it is actually a pretty robust product. It is kind of yeah. uh, meant to be an overlay of Fifth Edition Dungeons and Dragons, uh, using kind of the framework of the uh, basic rules. So you would need to have at least the basic rules for things like combat and turn order and, you know, all of that uh, good stuff. But this uh, product uh, is a um, meant to deliver on a post-apocalyptic kind of setting. Uh, And so it has a lot of material geared towards that. It has classes, it has races, um, and it actually does not have um, spells per se, no spell casting classes, but it does replace it with something that I think it's, is really interesting um, called uh, gambits. And I'll get into that in a, in a moment. But um, it really does just replace everything you know about Dungeons and Dragons as, as you know it um, with everything that's just flavored towards, um, 
towards like a post-apocalyptic setting. And, and, it, uh, and it, it's not specific. It's worth pointing out that it is also um, not available on the DMs Guild, but it is through drive through RPG. It's not a specific DMs Guild. They didn't. They don't need the license from DMs right. Guild for it. Uh, it's a whole. It's it's. And, and, and it's uh, the PDF copy is twenty dollars on on drive through RPG. Although you're working from a review copy, um, I remember them mm-hmm. sending this to me, and they were very excited. In fact, now I don't even remember if I think they sent it to me. I might have kickstarted it too. I don't remember now because uh, <laughs> um, I was very interested because I was running a post apocalyptic uh, campaign at the time, and I was looking for some some ideas uh, and whatever. Um, mm-hmm. Oh, you know what it was? I kickstarted their their thing before that, which was Hyperlanes, which was sort of their um, their sci fi uh, fifth edition D anD. d But yeah, it's sort of a, a like you said, it's an overlay yeah. of five e in the same way that Lewis had mentioned the the Middle Earth five e game, uh, which is not, doesn't exactly follow the five e rules, but is clearly a, a, an evolution or, or or derivative thereof, and so they. They market it as a five E product, so so yeah. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. I just wanted to give some context for people. No, no, uh, no problem. So what what I was about to say is that uh, it doesn't it doesn't say oh this is the apocalyptic scenario you're working with. It gives you options. Mm -hmm. So it could be like, did your are you in a nuclear winter? Um, Did your world turn into a desert? Uh, Just a nuclear wasteland? Are you being invaded by aliens? Uh, Are you and this is kind of topical. Are you? Uh, is your world subject to some kind of disease that killed <laughs> off most of society, or is it just zombies? Which, of course, is the, the uh, well was the hot just, thing. For just a while. zombies. Um, but <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, but uh, so yeah, it gives you a lot of really cool options. Um, it assumes that you had just a regular normal modern world that was then destroyed by whatever you know one of the above options uh and so you can actually be like a bestial which is you just have your humanoid animal uh and it has a actually a very impressive number of different options for that like anything from cats to crabs and so on so i think that's actually pretty neat it uh, kind of harkens back to the uh, after the bomb uh palladium role playing game if uh, anybody remembers that um, it also has a race called Mutant, which is kind of, uh, you would think that it's pretty self-explanatory, but they're actually, tri- um, instead of subclasses, they're split up into tribes, and the tribes are like, we fight back, we endure, we fix things, we read words, and depending on what the tribe is, you get like different subclass type bonuses from that, uh, which I thought was really cool. It doesn't assume that you're just like a mutant and you're strong. It just assumes that like you're a mutant and you adapt. Uh, which I think was really neat. Uh, and then the classes are um, kind of based slightly on D&D classes. You have the Marauder that's based on Barbarians. You have a Scavenger that's based on Sorcerer, but they kind of do more tinkering kind of stuff. Uh, you have a Nomad who's based on a Ranger, and so on. It's not it's not a perfect one-to-one. They don't really have like the same kind of things that uh, D&D classes do, but that's kind of the... Um, basic idea that they've got is like, like these are these are uh, post-apocalyptic characters that can do uh, you know very specific things in the flavor of post-apocalyptic settings and what have you. Um, and I, I think they did a, a phenomenal job in just putting that flavor in there and and making everything feel post-apocalyptic with the the wording that they use, with the uh, abilities that people have. Um, and it just it seems to shine through. Uh, and while I'm at it uh, with the flavor, the the art is actually fantastic. I don't know who they got to do the art, but uh, it's really good. Um, a, a little a little um, experimental at points, but I think overall good. It captures the feeling of post apocalyptic and almost like a cyberpunk kind of way. Okay. I'm going to let uh, Lewis ask questions first. <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah, so, yeah. So I don't dominate so, uh, all the time. Ish, uh, yeah, so look, look at it. I, just, I scratched on a few things as you were talking. Um, uh, is the assumption of this game setting um, a real-world post-apocalypse? It would appear kind to of be. A thing? Yeah. yeah. 
Okay. Uh, just all the all the key words you said kind of made me think that way. But because, uh, you know, I I don't think we see many and we probably should see more because it's kind of my opinion that, uh, you know, zombies was the, the end thing for a long time. And then post-apocalyptic was the end thing for a long time. And uh, and I feel like I would love to see some post-apocalyptic non real world stuff done. You know, mm -hmm. what's a, what's a post-apocalyptic forgotten realms look like? Right. You know, or uh, like dark that. Sun. That. You could do that with Zane. Post-apocalyptic forgotten dark realms is, is dark it's, sun. That's true. <laughs> right, right. Right, right. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Um, but, uh, so, so I was asking, it, it assumes that the base assumption for the game is a, uh, a, uh, a modern real world sort of a post-apocalypse is what I was asking. Correct. Yeah. Okay. All right, cool. Now, you didn't tell us about Gambits yet. Tell us about hey, Gambits. I, I talked for a long time, and I figured it would be a good idea to pause <laughs> just to give you guys a chance to, yeah, to yeah. say something edgewise. Uh, but Gambits are something that's available to every class. And instead of being a spell, it's almost like a stunt or, or, or a trick or like a, you know some kind of a gimmick almost. And so you've got uh, a number of things like you know being a field medic, and so you... Uh, use one of your like level four gambits that would then allow you to um, kill someone up and just patch them up. Or, you know, the, I'm looking at the, one of the gambits, it's uh, uh, Adrenaline Rush uh, description. After taking damage, you may pull this gambit as a reaction. For the duration, you gain five to your walking speed, 1d4 damage on melee and unarmed attacks. So they're just little boosts that, like, it, again, it, it harkens to uh, Book of Nine Swords and that it's just. It's not just for wizards. It's not just for sorcerers or whatever. It's anyone can use these things, and it's uh, almost like um, genre fuel, if you will. So, mm -hmm. like, if someone if, if someone is like just a badass bounty hunter type, then they're going to have someone that, something like gambits that'll let them like sustain damage, or that will let them uh, capture someone more easily, and so on and so forth. It's it, it, it's almost less magic than it is um, kind of uh, special effects. And I can't I remember. I there might there's probably more games than I can think of, but there was a game where instead of doing magic, it would be like a movie effect, and that was mm -hmm. kind of how they described it. But that's what this reminds me of. Gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. Cool. Yeah, Jeff, I've never played in Dark Sun. That's why I wasn't <laughs> thinking about that. <laughs> so thank well, you. Well, no, for that's how that I've up. oftentimes yeah. thought of Dark Sun. Um, is, is it's you know. Uh, what if at the beginning of the Forgotten Realms, the Primordials had one instead of the gods? That then you sort of get Dark Sun, right? Oh, cool. That's neat. That's neat. So another question, Ishmael. Uh, how mm -hmm. big is this thing? It's You said it's a $20 PDF, uh, so is it's it? got to be yeah. pretty big. Um, it's 185 pages with 175 of that actually being content. The rest is like, you know, table of context, uh, index, cover, and so on. Uh, but it's meaty. It's a really, really meaty book. One thing, well, I love this book. It looks great. It's something that I will probably pull numerous things mm -hmm. from. Uh, but one thing I would say, like the only detraction from the book is the uh, layout. Uh, and um, it's fine. I've seen work, work books that have been like m more poorly laid out than this. And I'm not trying to be too mean on the book. But um, with some of the layout decisions, it's just a little bit harder to read and a little bit harder to, to look through. It almost looks like someone put together a really good web page, but just fell short of putting together a really good uh, book to read through. Sure, sure. Yeah, so, so I'm curious, yeah. like, you talked about how there's all kinds of ideas here for you to pull at and, and, and use and whatever. Um, mm. But at the same time, and I found this to be true of, like, the, the Adventures of Middle-Earth uh, product um, that, that are sort of these, we're going to use most of the core system of 5e, but then otherwise change things and make it our own, is that... You mm -hmm. might that that I tend to be like I I might get a good idea here and there, but it's hard. It's not like you know picking up Xanathar's Guide or an adventure from Watsi or whatever where I can just like hey that's a cool layer I can yank that out and stick it in my campaign right uh, or mm -hmm. that's a that's a neat, that's a neat feat right. or a neat monster let me put that into my into my already existing campaign it's, it feels like if you're gonna run a Hellscapes campaign. Then, or a game or one that's inspired by it, you kind of have to like do that from session zero. Like this is the game we're going to play because it's dramatically different. 
That's okay. very true. So, yeah, you couldn't you couldn't switch it halfway and and just like make everyone adjust. That would be cruel and unusual. And I, and I think that's actually <laughs> where that where this came from. I think they uh, the creators of the of this game or this uh, product heard me at some point probably on the on the show talking about my post apocalyptic fantasy Earth game that I was running. Um, for a campaign that I was running for a long time, and like, oh, hey, this would be perfect for you. And it's like, yeah, but like, I'm already in the middle of the campaign, and I don't like. I, I read, I looked through it, and I'm like, I don't know that I could just convert to this, and I don't know how easy it would be to just like steal ideas mm-hmm. from it. Even like, I can't, I couldn't pull a monster out of Hellscapes and just use it in my normal five E game, could I? Uh, the monsters seem like the. They're a little bit okay. truncated, so like a monster might take up an index card, even if they're mm-hmm. uh, high challenge rating. But um, for the most part, the the truncation of the monsters is, is more of that uh, layout design uh, philosophy that I was talking about. I could see myself using this fairly easily uh, without any problem with the monsters, but there's a lot more about this book that makes a lot of us that would otherwise not uh, work. Um, so that that is something that would be a little okay. bit trickier. Uh, and just to clarify for for Jeremiah in the chat, um, Hellscapes doesn't. It's, it's, there's no lore. It doesn't have a specific core story or anything like that, right? So there's no setting or world. No, it does not. And I don't know if there's uh, if this same company that put this book out then went on to put out specific. Uh, settings or anything but this is very uh this is very generic uh it is meant to fit fit any post-apocalyptic scenario or most of them anyways uh and even the the bestiary kind of like gives you chunks of like here's if aliens are invading here's if there's zombies here's if like you are fighting against just normal people who are uh motorcycle gangs and so it, it uh tries to encompass as much of that as it can but it's not a specific story yeah. So it's more of a build your own apocalypse kit kind right. of yes. a thing. And as I sure. look through the publisher, it's, it's published by Scrivend. Um, as I look through their R- drive through RPG page, they actually have several products uh, that are giving that, that if you want some stories and some campaign material and whatever, um, they have that for their Hyperlanes uh, sci-fi built on top of a 5e uh, product, but it doesn't look like they have that for Hellscapes at this point. So, so if you want to know what kind of, what, yeah, if this, you want to know what kind of story to tell in this, uh, you're kind of on your own, although you could probably rip off a lot of other things and do it pretty easily. Sure. I could see a really, really cool game of Gamma World being done with this. Like this mm. would fit a really good Gamma World and be self-contained you would have everything here with like the basic rules of D and D and do it that way. I in fact, do uh, that. that's one of the things. One of the things that Jeremiah said when you first started talking about it is like, oh, so it's kind of like I could run Gamer World or the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles RPG in Fifth Edition. No. Yes. In fact, maybe including some of uh, uh, Lewis's product in there for the martial arts, right? <laughs> so. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, very likely. Yeah, wrestle very likely. those mutants yeah. down. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Any last uh, thoughts uh, from Ish or questions from Lewis about Hellscapes? Um, one one thing I wanted to add is that this is you know um, the product in itself is a master class and an overlay for um, changing the thematics of uh, of fifth edition. So if someone wants to say, like, hey, I want to do this genre for 5th edition, but I don't like 5th edition rules as they are. I just want to take the base idea of 5th edition and apply it to something else. Like, look at this book. Look at what they've done. Look at the work that they've put into it, the art direction that they've done, uh, layout uh, issues aside. Uh, They did a fantastic job of just giving you exactly what you need to um, have a game that's geared intensely towards one direction and so you could play fallout you could play uh gamma world you could play uh you know any number of these kind of post-apocalyptic settings with this uh in a pinch like it would it would be very easy to do so and uh in that respect this book really uh managed to uh meet the goal that it set out to to me all right excellent uh then our last product is coming from me um, it is a DMs Guild product. It is uh, it is a pay what you want uh, product. Um, although 
Um, I paid the suggested price of five dollars for it, uh, and it's a it's a thirty five page um, addendum addition to the intended for the Curse of Strahd campaign. Um, although I think there's some really good ideas here. Like I don't know that you could just take this product and steal bits and pieces for other games necessarily, but I think the general concept is a really interesting way of delivering some exposition and some background in a way that uh, DMs are mm. oftentimes um, struggling to do, right? Um, so in Curse of Strahd, one of the, the, there's a series of treasures that, that you can find, and their locations can be determined by a, a reading of the, the Taroka uh, cards by a fortune teller, right? Uh, and one of those uh, treasures that could be found is the Tome of Strahd. Um, the Tome of Strahd is, in many ways, a little bit underwhelming as a treasure, right? Uh, it's mostly just a, a, an option to deliver a bunch of exposition in the form of, here's a one-page handout that sort of tells you the story of Strahd and how he came to be who he is and whatever, right? It, it serves its purpose, it's quick, it's easy, right. uh, but that's all there is to it, right? It, it's a way of delivering a bunch of exposition. And then the players are like, well, why did I just go, I don't know, fight this killer hag that was grinding up the bones of children. Like, that was a really hard fight, and what, you gave... I got a one-page handout out of it? That doesn't seem worth it, right? Um, so so th <laughs> this product seeks to sort of fill that gap. Now, um, it, it's, and it's, it's titled uh, as being written by the Assiduous Adventurer. So I don't know who this person is, and, and, I don't, and that's the... the um, the bulk of the credits. Now, the last page, I'm scrolling all the way to the end here. The last page does cite some other credits for, for things like what the template they use for the, out, uh, for the layout and all that. Uh, and some people that, that provided inspiration. Um, uh, this person apparently um, took a lot of ideas and discussed this product a lot with a bunch of people on Reddit. And so he, he cites people by Reddit name uh, for having helped do the research and helped uh, with the inspiration and talk through some of this and all that. Um, <laughs> what right. a time to be alive. Uh, you know, and so usually, like, I look <laughs> at PDF products, I look at DMs Guild products, and I'm like, mm, if it doesn't talk about, like, who's your editor who uh, you know? Who special? Who who play tested it? So I know it's actually gone through some some rigorous uh, work to make sure it's balanced and mechanically sound and whatever. I'm a little hesitant, uh, but I had I had seen some people on the Curse of Straw DM Facebook group speaking highly of it. Uh, the reviews for well, the the there are no reviews on DMs Guild. I should put a review in. Uh, the discussions section though there seemed fairly uh, positive. Um, and it's a pay what you want, so I'm like, well, they're not asking, you know, they're not trying to, to, to bilk anybody here, um, so I'll, I'll give it a shot, right? And, and I picked it up and, and just started skimming through it a little bit and got, my, got engrossed into it and realized this is a really cool idea, and I ended up, plop, you know, I, I intended on, like, I'm not going to be at a point where I can use this for like a month or two. So I intended on like, yeah, I'll, I'll get to it eventually, right? I've, I've got this idea. I'll, I'll go look at it in more detail later. Uh, but then I couldn't put it down, and I read it straight through in like a day and a half. Uh, and this was before I was homebound, so I was still going to work every day and all that. Uh, so, um, so yeah, I found it really interesting. So the idea is that the Tome of Strahd is an actual uh, magic item. And uh, basically, and in terms of magical ability, it gives you advantage on lore checks about Strahd and Barovia and whatever. Uh, and it gives you a, a plus one bonus to AC and saves specifically versus Strahd. Right? So it's not super useful, but it, it gets that oh. one fight. It's a small tweak, a t small bonus, whatever. Right? That, so that's kind of cool. But then it's like broken down into there are 12 chapters and a prologue and an epilogue to this thing. Uh, and they're all they're all oh, wow. like magically encoded, uh, and so you have to go through a process of uh, e they say either investigation or arcana checks to decipher it. Now this is where there there could have been some some editorial work and whatever because there's there's some bits missing. Like it talks about how this is for characters level five through fifteen. Well, yeah, but that not really right. Uh, the the things that you're doing aren't really scaled in that way. That that's really that important. Um, 
And and when you say you have to make this check to decipher each chapter, there's not a lot of guidance in terms of what the DC is for that check. So, okay. Uh, so so some of the, and some of that I I feel like I'm gonna make it up as I go a little bit anyway. But the idea is you decipher a section, and once you've deciphered a section, it takes four hours. Um, you and anybody I think it was within like ten feet or fifty feet or whatever of you gets absorbed into the book. And you then live out a little mini adventure that tells the story of that chapter, right? So as in the beginning, uh, in the prologue, you're, you're absorbed into the book and you live out this scene with little 10-year-old Strahd running around and it sort of establishes his relationship with his parents and then his relationship with his brother uh, and all that kind of stuff. And it's sort of the first six chapters go through these early days, these formative years, the battles to conquer uh, uh, Ravenloft and to build the castle, the falling in love with Tatiana, uh, all the way up to the the big climactic uh, wedding scene, right? Tatiana is marrying Sergei and, and it all goes awry uh, and Sergei uh, is is killed and Tatiana goes flying over the edge of the... Cl- and you you as PCs are, are there living through all of that, right? And, and you're taking damage and you take it with you back out of the book and it's all very real to the point that like in the last chapter, Strahd like has this reflective moment of... I don't know who you people are that have shown up throughout my entire life, but you're always there at these important pivotal moments, right? So it, yeah. it, it's all real. It all actually happened. Um, yeah, right? Oh, wow. And then at the end, after you've gone through that, you, you get a little um, – each time you unlock a chapter and go through this little mini adventure, you actually unlock um, a, basically a spell that you can then cast as a ritual spell. Uh, once per day, you can cast this, this spell as a ritual using the book as sort of the components to make it possible. Uh, and so it, it's got some usefulness there as well. Um, so, and so it sort of grows in usefulness uh, over time. But it introduces you to uh, Argen Volstholt, uh, the, the silver dragon that starts the, the order uh, in Barovia. It introduces you to the formation of the, the Heart of Sorrows that, that Strahd uses to protect himself. So, you, so it gives you some hints that that's a thing. It introduces you to uh, the Battle of Yester Hill with the Druids there and all of that. And so you, you kind of like, uh, what is it? The, there's, a, there's, the, there's the town that's in ruins. Was it Brezev or something like that? Berez? Um, that's been flooded and is in ruins now, but it gives you the, the sense of how that happened and how Strahd pulled in the magic from the river and, and, and flooded it with a tsunami and destroyed all the people. Like it's got these really cool moments and these really cool stories. And part and like and this is where I'm kind of torn on the whole thing is that I don't know, like how much do I want to just incorporate this as is, and how much do I want to be like, oh well. Let's not let them unlock the chapter on Argen Vosholt until they've actually been there, you know, or, you know, until they wander into the ruins of Berez. I'm not going to let them unlock the chapter on Berez. On the other hand, I want them to unlock them in order because it sort of lays out a narrative of Strahd's life. So uh, I'm still toying with exactly how I'm going to use it. I know um, in terms of how to unlock the chapters, I think I'm going to tweak that a little bit uh, in, from what's here. Um, but otherwise, like, I really like what's here. Like, I feel like by the time they get to the end, there's a couple of, you know, you're involved in this battle and, and you're fighting things and whatever. And there's not going to be a significant challenge there in terms of the combats, especially if they're level 12 or 15 at that point, like the, the introduction of the, of the product suggests, um, those fights won't be a challenge at all. But then again, uh, I don't know that challenging the characters in combat is really the point, right? It's it's about experiencing these moments in Strahd's life and getting this exposition by living through the exposition. Um, that's really important. Uh, so so anyway, yeah, I absolutely like I was I, I had hopes um, for this product, and then I got it, and I'm like, oh, holy cow! This like is really like it lacks clearly it lacks some playtesting, it lacks some some editorial work. 
but given that it's a, a pay what you want product, um, and even at the five dollars suggested price, I think it's absolutely worth it. And it gave me a ton of, of great ideas on, on what to do with my Curse of Strahd campaign. Uh, and it gives me a great idea of the kinds of like if you've got a game where you've got a lot of exposition, this is the kind of thing you could totally do with any game, right? Now you can't just rip off what they did here, right? You can't just use these adventures in your game, uh, but you can totally like I can totally see uh, finding you know. Like I could, I could see uh, changing Descent into Avernus and doing this for Descent into Avernus, where every time uh, Lulu regains some memories, she actually like absorbs the party in to the memory, and you actually live through these memories with the fall of Zeriel and, and all. Like I think there's some uh, fantastic uh, ideas here, uh, and I really like. Yeah. I really like. Oh God, yeah. that, no, that's... it's it's. I think if 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 this author. Um, put a little bit more into it and and beefed it up a little bit. Got some nice custom art for it. And all that. I mean, this could easily be uh, worth a being a ten dollar product and and enhance all kinds of things in people's games. Uh, and you could recreate it for all these different types of adventures. Um, so anyway, I th I thought I think it's fantastic. So um, I'm gonna let you ask questions though. I've talked a lot. Sure, Jeff. What was the, the interactive title of Tome of Strahd? Which is also not a very evocative uh, title, <laughs> and so that's one of the reasons. Like I saw it months ago and didn't didn't pick it up um, until I saw some other people uh, ranting and raving about it. Um, and part of why I didn't pick it up is like, yeah, but like the layout and, like, it doesn't have any art. The cover doesn't isn't very exciting. Like this, I, how much did this person really put into this? But the answer is a good amount <laughs> and, the, and some really good ideas. Yeah. Okay, so my first thing isn't a question so much as a, a, a comment to interact with you uh, with about this. Um, this is exactly what yeah. DM's Guild is for, is this kind of thing, okay? Because mm -hmm. I, I ran Curse of Strahd for my group, and it's actually my favorite 5th edition story that I've done. I really enjoyed it, and I got a lot out of it personally. I had a great time with it. But you're right, that dang book yeah. is a lame duck. It's a necessary MacGuffin to get you from point A to point B in the story, but it's a, it's a lame duck thing. And this guy looked at that and said, that's a lame duck. You, you, I can we, do you, better. You assume guy. And I don't know that did. it's a guy. But. And, <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. The assiduous the adventure. It's the assiduous adventure. Yeah, valid point. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Um, and also another thing that this fixes, which this was a problem – both in the Princes of the Apocalypse story and to a lesser degree in Curse of Strahd, is you've got these villains with these amazing, interesting stories. They are very, very cool villains. But like Princes of Apocalypse has written, the four elemental prophets, the first time the characters interact with them is when they walk in the room and are going to fight them, as written. You know, so I tinkered with that a lot when I ran Princes of the Apocalypse. And Strahd... The, the the book as written gives you some cues for that, but this is such an interesting, well-developed character um, that I think that this technique of using the book that way is a fantastic idea to give you all of his story. And I'm really sad I didn't know about this resource when I ran. Of course, I don't know if it was out yet when I ran Curse of Straw, but I'd have used the heck out of this. Yeah. Yeah, and Marcus, sure. uh, in the in Marcus in the chat is asking, yeah. uh, would it work if you played through it backwards? Like the players meet Strahd, and he's like, why are you guys following me all the time? And then you sort of play through um, the the story then to give the background after you after you defeat him. Uh, and and that, could, that could totally work. That's cool. Um, I don't think I want to do it that way, but it could totally work. I, and I don't want to do it that way because there's almost like there's almost a little element – of you get to sympathize, not sympathize so much, but empathize, understand the villain, you know, and, and how he became, like yeah. he was just an innocent kid and you get to see how he became the villain, but you get to see exactly how far he falls and how horrible he becomes. And he very clearly is, like, it sort of ramps up this this horror element of who Strahd is. And, you know, it, it you know one of the scenes is you actually play through his encounter at the Amber Temple where he meets the the dark power and becomes, you know, makes his pact and, and all oh, of that. Oh, man. Uh, like, it's, it's got so much of the lore. And some of those, there's some areas where... Um, the author describes that they they 
they found some areas where there wasn't a ton of lore, and that's where this Reddit thread came in. These users sort of developed this extra lore that they incorporated uh, in, in here as well. But I think uh, these users must have been fairly well well read on on Strahd's story because I've I've read the the I Strahd novel, and everything that's here is fairly consistent with what's in the I Strahd novel as well. Um, so yeah, no, I think the the lore in it is is pretty much spot on, and will work perfectly for what I'm trying to yeah. do. Jeff, another question then. Um, do the players know that this is real while they're in the book experiencing these things, or do they only discover later that it was real? Do you um, understand what I'm saying? Yeah, like, 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 are you living through memories, or are you actually going back in time and living through the real thing, right? Um, right, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so so I don't know that there's any strong, like, it didn't, in my head, reading through it, I assumed they were living through memories until there was that moment at the end of the book where Strahd kind of makes this this side comment of, you know, you lot have sort of appeared throughout my life at various times and whatever. And then I'm like, oh, oh. Yeah, yeah. So, so I guess the yeah. whole thing was real, right? Maybe they were traveling back. At the, and they carry damage and yeah. you can they can carry items with them as well. You can pick up something in the memory. And then carry it mm -hmm. with you when mm -hmm. you come back, as long uh, with with some exceptions. Yeah. I think there's some exceptions like magic items and that kind of stuff don't carry forward and whatever. But sure, sure, sure. Yeah. And the reason I'm asking about that is I think it would like certainly with my with one of my two parties, it would be best if they didn't know it was real right. at the time because this would instantly become a travel back in time and kill Hitler moment. Right. Oh yeah, sure. For I'm I'm thinking of a certain player in my group. Who would stab that ten-year-old kid in a heartbeat? <laughs> well, <laughs> you know. Yes. Yeah. Well, yeah, and, and I don't think there's any strong yeah. hints that that's what's happening. And then, other than like, I went into this thing and I fought a battle and I was injured in the battle and I came out still injured, right? But that could just be explained by that's the magic of the book. And honestly, for sure, you, you one could argue that even in that moment where Strahd makes a comment about how you follow me through my life, that could still just be the magic of the book describing the you know the, the memory of the book yeah, remembering right. so so is, is it real I, I don't know does it matter <laughs> you know um you know and the and the players yeah. have agency like the 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 adventure the little mini adventures are written in such a way that it's very clear like um you, you know you're serving as the lieutenants to to general strahd in this battle uh, and he's giving you these orders and you run off to to follow those orders but you can very well, knowing who Strahd is and how he's such a horrible person, you can join the other side and, and work against Strahd. And the, the, the campaign still works. The, the adventure still works. Cool. Uh, and so, yeah. So, uh, you know, there, and there's lots of different, you know, there's a battle where it's like, oh, well, you could go to this place. You can go to this place. You can go to that place. And there's sort of these three, you know, there's, so there's agency even within the memories of what you specifically want to experience. So no. Yeah, yeah, that's cool. I think it works and that's it's cool. really well done. So. Yeah, I'm gonna let Ishmael talk. I've been talking too much. <laughs> I was just going to note that this like uh, probably something that someone did in their own game, and it mm -hmm. worked really well, and they put it down in words, which uh, to kind of uh, echo what was already said, that's exactly what DMs guild should be for. Uh, as if you have a great idea that worked really well that can translate to other people's campaigns, uh, which it sounds like this absolutely can, and it's giving me all kinds of ideas. Because um, uh, I'm, I'm actually going to be doing like an Avernus, Fendelin, Curse of Strahd thing at the request of my players. So those are the, I'm going to have to tell um, <laughs> I'm going to have to take, tell Mike Schley about that so that he can roll his eyes. But um, Mike Schley, yeah. Schley, not Schley, Shay, Shay, sorry. Um, how do Mike, Mike Anyways, Schley is the, is the but, cartographer uh, artist that has done a lot of stuff for Watsi in the past. Yeah. <laughs> so. <right. laughs> um, uh, yeah. Anyways, um, but it just seems like this is uh, such a really uh, well realized product, uh, such a really well done um, uh, product that could that could very easily be translated into anyone's games. That could give people uh, a host of ideas, not just for Curse of Strahd. But for how you could really play with uh, the narrative, uh, and and really kind of mess with the uh, the, um, I guess with the uh, kind of temporal structure of a game, and and not necessarily break it uh, in a way that maybe most people would um, be worried that time travel would do so. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. So Very yeah, cool. 
I think we've we've talked about three uh, really interesting products covering a very wide gambit of different types of, of things that could be done, right? Um, but I think uh, unless anybody has anything else they desperately want to say, uh, we're going to call that the end of the episode. All right. Perfect. Then I want to say thank you to all of our listeners and our chat room uh, for keeping us on our toes. Uh, and I want to thank those of you who go out of their way to support us by shopping at Amazon or DMs Guild through the links at thetomeshow.com or for all of our patrons at patreon.com slash thetomeshow. Uh, I also want to thank our guests, Lewis, Brenton, where can people find you on the interwebs? Uh, the two best places to find me are uh, on Twitter at Rev Lewis Brenton, and uh, the other place is as the anchor of the Tome Show News, which comes out every couple of weeks here on this network. Uh, we we do a very quick ten to fifteen at the max minute show covering some D and D headlines from the last couple of weeks, and that's something I'm really enjoying cool. doing. I know I've I've enjoyed listening to it as well. It's always fun. Um, when a, a, a podcast episode f- comes out on the Tome Show that I wasn't on, so I get to listen to it with new ears for the first time. It's always fun. You know, I started this 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 thing you know a, over a decade ago because I really wanted it to exist and it didn't. Nobody was doing it. Um, now it exists, and every now and then I can still listen to it. <laughs> so. <laughs> right. <laughs> All right. Uh, also, I want to thank you, uh, Ismail. Alvarez, who is King Lorathorn or Elven Wizard King everywhere on the social in- internets, um, and who is yes. an example of why DMs Guild exists with his Aurora's uh, Whole Realms guides. Uh, what, what else do you want to tell people about? Uh, well, really quick, um, I know that me and my comrades who have done the Aurora's Whole Realm catalogs actually put the summer catalog up in... Um, and I, I'm going to mess this up, but it's like a, a COVID relief um, uh, bundle. Uh, so if anyone's interested at the time of this listening, I, 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 don't, I have a feeling that this will go on for a while. Uh, but buy that bundle uh, and help out people who need it. Uh, but also I have a pending release that should be coming out within the next few weeks, which is uh, part of the simple settings line for uh, Fat Goblin. The first one I did was Savage Lands, which was actually kind of a prehistoric setting. The next one is uh, Grim. Well, it's Fairy Tales, which is uh, very much in line with like Grimm's Fairy Tales and what have you. A lot of that flavor in there. All right, now I got to go back to my script because I was looking up the Aurora's Hall Realms uh, guides uh, and, and realized <laughs> I can't buy them to support the COVID nineteen work because I already own them. So there we go. All right, uh, and with that done then, I just want to let people know if you want to get a hold of the show, you can email the tome show at gmail.com. That comes to me, and then I distribute it to whoever needs to see it. Uh, you can find me on Twitter. I am at Squatch, S-Q-U-A-C-H. If you want to uh, talk to Tracy about dealing with not being able to read because she's working from home uh, with children, uh, you can tweet her. She is at Sarah Dark Magic. Uh, if you want to tweet the show, it is on Twitter as at the Tome Show, and that is episode three hundred and thirty. Oh, I think my number is wrong. Three hundred thirty-six, where we where we have dug through all five hundred PDFs that came out uh, on the internet today, <laughs> uh, and picked out our three favorite ones to talk about in this episode of the Tome. The end. Uh, yes, Jeremiah, I saw that you Ooh. turned in the next Monstrous Ecologist. Thank you for doing that. It should be out. I'll, I don't know when Sam's going to get it, but there we go. Uh, and Ishmael, uh, Marcus wants you to repeat the bundle name. Uh, I will. If you give me a momentary moment, I will bring that up. A momentary moment. <laughs> yes. It's a yes. very technical term. He's a chronomancer. <laughs> yeah. uh, let's see I thought I had it ready but I don't think I do um, I will have to talk to my colleagues and I will tweet it out is later is it listed under I'm just searching the guild uh, uh, they asked me recently if uh, if I was okay with them putting it into the bundle and I said yes and it's entirely possible they have not yet so there's also that possibility so, so let me Again, I will I will uh, confer with them and see, and if it's available, I will tweet it out 
uh, and I will tag the Tome Show. So just keep okay. an eye out for that because I feel bad for not having it ready. There's another one similar. There's the the Stay Home Play Games Bundle. But that's uh, all by a, a single author. Mm. But it's got a pretty abyssal chicken on the cover. <laughs> so, uh, all right, well. I don't believe that one is no. it. No. Um, okay, I will, so you'll, I will you'll figure that out and then uh, tweet it out so so Marcus can find it. So if you follow uh, at the Tome Show um, and keep an eye out for that, you'll, you'll get it that way. All right. Then I'm going to go ahead and wrap this thing up. So thanks for lis- uh, listening to us, watching us, doing all those things. Uh, those of you on the Twitch stream. Um, and thanks to the two of you for joining us. I, I hope you had fun tonight. And, and in fact, Absolutely did. am I going to sure see did, man. both of the two of you again next week? Is that right? For our uh, book club? Um, I'm going to be here for the, uh, the Bulgaria yeah, right book, yes. Yes. All right. Yeah, absolutely. So, so the, 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 so, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Hey, Jeff, quick thought for you. Um, um, I was I was pondering.